And we're talking ghosts, hauntings, all that good stuff. And get this, we're using a book from 1908 as our guide. 1908. Now, that's going back a bit. What's the book? Historic Ghosts and Ghost Hunters by H. Addington Bruce. It's fascinating, really gives you a feel for how people back then saw the supernatural. Well, I can imagine. The supernatural wasn't just some fringe thing back then, was it? Not at all. It's I... practically mainstream. But uh, before we get too far ahead of ourselves, let's dive into our first haunting. The Devils of Loudun. Oh, yes. The Devils of Loudun. A convent in 17th century France, if I remember correctly. You got it. Suddenly, this convent becomes like the epicenter for accusations of demonic possession, the whole nine yards. It's a classic case, really. And to think this is a time when the Catholic Church is at its peak, fear of the devil is very real. Then, bam, you have these nuns acting strangely, voices changing, bodies contorting. Yeah, and Bruce doesn't hold back on the details. Reading about these nuns, it's enough to give you chills, even now. And at the center of it all, Father Grandier. Remember him? Oh, how could we forget? Poor Father Grandier, accused of being in cahoots with the devil himself. It's almost like a witch hunt, but with a priest as the target. You hit the nail on the head. It really makes you think about the power of rumors, mass hysteria. Back then, an accusation like that, especially with supposed demonic influence, well, let's just say it wasn't easy to shake off. Definitely not. And it really highlights how different things were back then, right? Yeah. They, they didn't have the same understanding of what we now call mental health. Precisely. Today, some of those behaviors might be diagnosed as hysteria or extreme stress, but back then it was seen through a very different lens, a supernatural one. It's like their beliefs literally shaped how they saw the world around them. Speaking of skewed perceptions, shall we move on to our next haunting? The Drummer of Tedworth. Oh, yes. The Drummer of Tedworth. Now there's a story that'll keep you up at night. A good old-fashioned poltergeist case. It's like something out of a horror movie. This family, the Montfassons, they start experiencing these relentless, unexplained noises. Knocking, mostly. And they blame this traveling drummer they had a disagreement with. And accuse him of witchcraft, no less. Can you imagine being accused of witchcraft in court today? It'd be unbelievable. But back then, people took it seriously. He actually went on trial. It's a testament to how fine the line between belief and skepticism could be, even for the supposed learned people of the time. So what do you think? Was it really witchcraft? Or did Bruce offer any other explanations? Well, he does hint at the possibility of more rational explanations. For instance, he brings up the Mampasan children. Kids will be kids, right? You mean like they were playing pranks? Precisely. Maybe consciously, maybe not. But children are quite good at unconsciously tapping into the atmosphere, the stories they hear. And, well, sometimes things just get out of hand. And the line between imagination and reality can get blurred. Exactly. Which leads us to a case where that line gets even more interesting. The haunting of the Wesley family. Wait, the Wesleys? As in the John Wesley? The Methodist guy? The one and only. Turns out... Even the founder of Methodism had his fair share of ghostly encounters. You're kidding. This I gotta hear. So what happened? Well, picture this. It's the early 1700s, the Wesley family rectory. Suddenly, strange sounds, objects moving on their own the whole bit. And it wasn't just one or two people who experienced it. We're talking multiple family members, including John Wesley himself. Hold on, hold on. John Wesley himself. What did he say he saw or heard? It wasn't so much about seeing, more like hearing, knocking, footsteps, even something the children called Old Jeffrey. They gave it a nickname. Imagine being a kid in that house. That's wild. Yeah. But it does make you think how much of what they experienced was really, well, real. Or how much was shaped by their environment, their beliefs. It's the age-old question, isn't it? And one we still grapple with today. It really makes you wonder, doesn't it? How much of what we experience is shaped by what we already believe? Absolutely. And it makes you wonder about those cases where there isn't an easy explanation. Yeah. You know, the ones that make you go, hmm, that's strange. Which I think leads us perfectly to Emanuel Swedenborg. Ah, Swedenborg. Now, there was a fascinating figure. Talk about a Renaissance man. Scientist, philosopher, theologian, and then some. Bruce really delves into his life. And what a life it was. I mean, we're talking about a respected scholar, a member of Swedish parliament. He wasn't some fringe mystic, you right, know. But not at all. But then, yeah. well, then things took a turn, didn't they? You could say that. He starts having these visions, talking with angels, even claiming trips to heaven and hell. Heaven and hell. It's like something out of a movie. So what did Bruce make of all that? That's the interesting part. 
Bruce approaches Swedenborg with this careful blend of fascination and skepticism, like always. He doesn't outright dismiss these wild claims. So he's open to the possibility that maybe, just maybe, Swedenborg is onto something. Well, he does suggest that maybe, in certain states of mind, trances, extreme stress, who knows our perceptions can get a little warped. So you're saying Swedenborg might not have actually been hanging out with angels. It's possible. Maybe those visions were his mind's way of processing these huge, complex spiritual concepts he was grappling with. It's amazing what the human mind is capable of, isn't it? <laughs> but let's be real. Not every ghost story can be chalked up to an overactive imagination. Mm. What did Bruce have to say about the cases that seemed a bit off, even for him? Well, that's where things get really interesting. Because Bruce doesn't shy away from the possibility of trickery. Trickery? You mean like hoaxes and scams? Exactly. After Swedenborg, he dives into cases like the Cock Lane Ghost, which, spoiler alert, was most likely a hoax. A, a hoax? What happened? Tell me more. It was a whole scandal back in the 1760s. People flocking to this house in London, claiming to hear this ghost, a scratching fanny. Turns out it was all a setup orchestrated by the homeowner to frame her former landlord. Wow. Talk about holding a grudge. So it seems like even back then, the world of ghost hunting had its fair share of con artists. Oh, absolutely. But that's what makes Bruce's approach so refreshing. He doesn't just take these stories at face value. He wants us to think critically, to question, to look at all sides. Which is a skill we could all use a little more of these days, don't you think? couldn't agree more, especially with so much information and misinformation flying around these days. It's easy to get swept up in a good story. But Bruce reminds us to take a step back, to examine the evidence, and to draw our own conclusions. So after diving into all these stories of hauntings, hoaxes, and everything in between, what's the biggest takeaway for you? What's stuck with you? You know, for me, it's that reminder that the line between what we believe and what we perceive is so thin. These stories, whether genuine hauntings or clever deceptions, really highlight how our beliefs, our fears, our desires, they all shape how we see the world around us. It's like we're all wearing these invisible glasses that color how we see everything. Exactly. And sometimes those glasses can make us see things that aren't really there or miss things that are. It's true, though, isn't it? Our perceptions can really play tricks on us. No doubt about it. But that's what makes these stories so fascinating. They force us to confront those blurry lines between belief and reality, you know? Yeah. But okay, after diving into all these accounts, did Bruce ever actually, you know, offer his own take? How did he think these hauntings were legit? Well, that's the thing about Bruce. He's a bit of a sly one, you know? He lays out all this evidence, often in some pretty chilling detail, but he kind of leaves it up to the reader to decide what to believe. So he's not trying to force his own conclusions down our throats. Exactly. He presents those natural explanations, you know, like hoaxes, pranks, even suggests that sometimes it's just the human mind playing tricks, especially when people are stressed or scared. But he's not ruling out the possibility of something more. He's not. And that's what makes his book so engaging. He's basically saying, hey, here's what I found. What do you make of it? I like that. It's like he's turning us into amateur ghost hunters, right? Yeah. <laughs> Makes you think twice about that creaky door at night. It certainly does. But in all seriousness, that critical thinking, that ability to question what we see and hear, that's something we could all use a bit more of. Absolutely. So after this deep dive into historic ghosts and ghost hunters, what's your big takeaway? What's stuck with you? For me, it's that constant reminder that what we believe can so easily influence what we experience. These stories, whether real hauntings or clever fakes, they all highlight just how powerful those beliefs can be. It's like our minds are always trying to make sense of the world, find explanations, and sometimes those explanations lead us right into the realm of the supernatural. Exactly. And who are we to say those explanations are wrong, or right for that matter? It's all part of the mystery. And that's a wrap on this deep dive into historic hauntings. Huge thanks to you, the listeners, for joining us. We love geeking out about this stuff with you. We do, and we'd love to hear your thoughts on these cases. Do you think there were truly supernatural forces at work, or do you have a more down-to-earth explanation? Hit us up on social media and share your theories. Until next time, keep those lights on. Or don't. It's your call. See you in the next deep dive.